let me share my screen. You guys seeing uh, the the markdown presentation? Yes. Yes. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. So so this chapter was uh, quite lengthy, as you would expect, since uh, we're covering a lot of the techniques we've we've covered uh, throughout the last half year. Um, the idea here is we're concentrating on a single data set that we haven't seen uh, previously. So this is a uh, uh, a football or you know soccer um, data set uh, from 2019, and you know it's it's really a soup soup to nuts uh, exploration, model building, looking at model metrics, uh, looking at data set level uh, plots that we've covered like permutation feature importance and partial dependence profiles, and uh, and then we look at instance level explanations for uh, a couple players using um, breakdown plots, Shapley, Ceteris Paribus profiles, a couple others. Um, there were some plots that were left out in this chapter and I, I was hoping I could get to them, but I just ran out of time. Uh, like the ALE plots, which are supposed to be better for interactions. They weren't explicitly mentioned in the text. Uh, Lime was a notable exception. Uh, let's see. And then the, the Ceteris uh, Paribus oscillations, which is just a, a variation on the CP profiles, uh, again, to to handle uh, interaction. So I don't I don't know if you folks uh, went down the rabbit hole at all uh, for this, but I, I did not. Um, definitely happy to, to uh, look at what you have if, if you have gone down that rabbit hole. But um, I basically just covered what was in the chapter uh, just because, it, again, it was a, quite a lengthy uh, treatment this week. Okay, uh, yeah, so my understanding is that the data comes from uh, originally from uh, a website uh, that I've linked here. Uh, of course, if you go to it now, it's it's more covering 23, 24, and, and uh, I believe uh, a lot of the player rankings derive from uh, the FIFA uh, soccer or football uh, video game, which is really interesting to me. Um, be believe it or not, um, you know, a, a lot of uh, sports bettors <laughs> use video game stats um, for, for betting on games. Uh, I'm familiar with um, the NFL, for instance. Um, you know, one thing you can do is use like Madden uh, football ratings for individual players to construct an early season model, right? Before you're accumulating, you know, in-game experience. Uh, that That's kind of a helpful a priori uh, model that you can use when you when you just don't have a lot of data, and I, I'm assuming uh, folks take advantage of the individual player ratings in, in, in soccer as well. So I thought this was a really interesting chapter for me because I kind of delve into uh, sports betting a little bit and have have built some of these these models in the past. Uh, and just an FYI, I guess there's a Kaggle uh, link to that was mentioned in the in the book. It appears to be dead though, uh, no longer active. Uh, one of the challenges this week is um, the the FIFA data set that's referenced in the text appears to be different than the the, the FIFA data set that's that's currently available in the Dalex package. Uh, just to give you a couple examples, uh, the naming convention of the variables are a bit different, and the number the number of uh, fields is uh, slightly lower. Uh, and, and what's currently available in the, the Dalex uh, website. Uh, I didn't really go as far to see if, if there was like an archived version of this data set on the author's webpage. That, that may have been helpful, but um, what I did uh, throughout these slides is I, I just used the, the, uh, the FIFA data set that's available on the Dalex package now. So, you know, what I'm doing won't um, perfectly, you know, mirror what's being done in the text. Um, you know, similar results, but not identical. So keep that in mind as we, we go through this. So uh, Aaron, I, I just have a comment there. And mm -hmm. I found the same issue, okay, mm -hmm. that the, the, the FIFA data set on the Dalex package is not the same as yep. the one presented in the textbook. And what I did was go to the GitHub repo of the textbook 
Uh, it's yeah. called e a a EMA. And um, I found the, the data set there. It's called FIFA small 19.RDA. Okay. So uh, for okay. reference, gotcha. you know, if, if you want to replicate, reproduce, you know, the same results, you have to go to that data set. Okay. Yeah. Not, not use the da Daleks data set for some yep. weird yep. reason. <laughs> so, so that's just, uh, you know, an FYI. Honestly, it was helpful for me to have to change up the, the code, right? behind the scenes, uh, I feel like I, I learned a little bit more as opposed to just copying and pasting some of the scripts from the uh, from the repo itself. But that's that's interesting that the uh, the ar kind of the archived version of the FIFA data sets out there. Yeah, th definitely something happened when they, you know, released the package that, you know, they, they use another data set from, yeah. from the FIFA. <laughs> and one other thing that I noticed is the Python scripts appear to reference the updated data set set and not hmm. the the old version that that's, that's referenced so you'll see like <laughs> the, the variable names are different right uh, there as well and um th there's an another interesting thing i'll, I'll point out later but <laughs> but but yeah that so this was a bit challenging since since the the textbook is a little bit out of a little bit out of date at this point correct that's correct yeah <laughs> okay so uh, yeah, we have roughly 5,000, we have 5,000 rows and, uh, you know, 42 uh, variables to work with based on the current data set. Our target is uh, we're trying to project um, player value, um, and that's in, in euros. And um, so what the authors do is they in inspect, you know, this, this uh, particular variable to target, and they noted that it's pretty skewed. You know, I calculated a skewness metric of four, which is pretty skewed, not as skewed as I see like in healthcare claim costs, but it's still, you know, very right skewed. And so what they do is they they take uh, the log transformation uh, of this variable. It, it makes it, uh, you know, roughly bell-shaped symmetric uh, once you apply that. And so ultimately we're going to fit our models based on the, the logged, uh, value, and then we're going to back transform it. Um, I, I'm going to get on my soapbox a little bit later about whether or not that's the, the best thing to do. And I'd argue that that's not a universal, like you should always take the log transform of your target variable. Um, but, but that's just a little, little prelude to a, a discussion later. Uh, but that's what the authors do. So we're going to stick with that for now. Um, then they, they kind of go over a handful of variables uh that are important uh one of those being age um and so we have a series of histograms here for, for age and, and age is uh fairly symmetric here uh and uh, ranges from about 16 to 41 in our data set average age is in the mid to late 20s have a couple other uh, interesting variables that ex are, are showing a bimodal uh bimodal characteristics that's ball control and dribbling. And those particular variables, I understand um, the reason why we're seeing that bimodal distribution is, is uh, you have goalkeepers uh, that, that are, are just here uh, on the lower end uh, for, for dribbling and ball control. So uh, yeah, what you're seeing on the, on the left side of the, these two bottom graphs are, are really reflecting the distribution of, of goalkeepers. And then everyone else is uh, kind of uh, in the rightmost area, which is you know, more symmetric. Okay, uh, and then as just another high level exploration, uh, what we're doing is we're comparing the uh, the target variable on a log scale uh, against those four uh, feature variables, uh, just just to see if there's any kind of relationship that we can glean from this. And of course, you know, these relationships might be confounded by relationships with other variables, but it's a, you know, a, a logical first place to start. Uh, on the top left, you see the relationship of, of um, age or value with age. And, and of course, as, as the players do age, their, their values go, go down. You start seeing that in their early mid thirties. Um, whereas the other three features that we're looking at here are really skill type variables. And, you know, the more skill you have, uh, the more valuable you are as a player, which which makes sense. What, what's interesting to me is you see like uh, ball control and dribbling. 
or it's almost like a flat line until you reach a certain threshold and then and then you, you know the value starts going up on pretty much a, a linear fashion whereas this movement reactions um relationship with with value appears to be more linear kind of a, across the, the continuum there um, less of a, a straight line until you hit the threshold so that's uh you know a real quick overview and in, 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 a, in a real world scenario we'd probably be looking at all the variables uh but uh you know time is limited and so we're just focusing on a a, a handful here and then we can look at the relationship between the features themselves and we do see that there's a really high correlation, 95% um, between ball control and dribbling. You know, so in, in a realistic scenario, you might consider uh, potentially only keeping one of those variables. Um, of course, you know, there are things you can do like PCA. We've talked about that in, in earlier discussions, um, com combining some of these, these highly correlated uh, variables together. Um, and interestingly enough, uh, age, doesn't seem to be highly correlated with those other skills. Um, yet we we do know that player value goes down as you age. So that that's a little little interesting tidbit, right? Like you would think your your value should be based primarily on your skills, not your age. But you know potentially that that reflects. You know I'm speculating here, but you know potential um, discrimination, right, for those older players. Um, uh, possibly recognizing the fact that you have a limited lifespan, you're more likely to get injured, et cetera. Um, but you can still have <laughs> good age as a soccer player. Um, but but again, your your value may, may still go down because uh, we're seeing that in the data. Okay. And I'm just, you know, if you have any questions or comments, feel free, but I'm, I'm just going to keep on trucking since there's just a lot of material here. Um, you know, after we've, we've done our data exploration, we're, we're moving on to, to building our models. Um, again, we're, we're modeling the log of player value uh, against most of the, the, the variables in the data set. We're removing a few um, based on what the, the book is recommending, like nationality. Um, we're, we're not including there. And, you know, <laughs> there, there's, there's, I think about data ethics. Uh, you know, and, and one thing a lot of times I, I do insurance rating is you don't want to um, rate based on, you know, nationality, ethnicity, et cetera. Um, that, that's one uh, possibility for removing, you know, just, you know, you know, these, these uh, explicit d discrimination in your models. Although sometimes even, even though you get rid of these variables, that there can still be implicit bias there that you, you want to remove if possible. I guess that's that's the subject for another course or you know another book or something. But um, you know that's that's one of the reasons I'm guessing that the textbook recommended removing that that variable. Um, and so I created a separate training and test set uh, for my examples. What I noticed in the GitHub repo for the authors is they use the entire data set. For, for training the model and and looking at the the, the um, model metrics and and creating the creating the model explainers, but the, the models took a different approach for the Python code, where they actually created a separate training and test set, which I think is the appropriate thing to do, particularly um, when you're uh, evaluating you know your model in terms of those model fit metrics like root mean squared error. Like you want to do that on the test set, not that not you know, the same data set you're using for training. So I, I took that approach as, as well, um, just because I, I think that's the appropriate thing to do. So just a, another area of departure from, from what the book is doing. Wanted to point that out there. Uh, fitting four models. And uh, one of those is an OLS model. Uh, so ordinary least squares. The difference is that we're uh, basically building a spline on every uh, numeric variable. Um, in the in the book, or at least on the, the repo, like it's it's pretty net hairy looking code to do that. So I created like the shorthand paste formula, um, so that I can just easily, without a lot of code, um, encapsulate all the variables in this RCS function, which is a, a sort of um, cubic spline function. I don't know what the R stands for. I'd have to yeah, the, uh, the the documentation on that. But uh, so it's it, it's a little bit more complicated than a. Uh, standard OLS. 
uh, we're fitting a, a ranger random forest model and then two GBMs, uh, one that has a tree depth of four, we're calling that the deep GBM model, and then one of depth of one, we're calling that the, the, the shallow model. So you would expect that the, the deep model would, would pick up uh, higher level interactions that the shallow one couldn't pick up. Right, so um, not much codes involved in fitting those those models. We're not doing any, um, you know, extensive tuning here in real life. We we probably would want to do that, use cross validation, etc. But you know, you know, the, the purpose here is is just trying to understand the the techniques for model explanation. So we we didn't get that deep here. Um, here I'm just showing you the code for uh, instantiating the the model explainers. That's part of the Daleks package. We've seen this before. Um, I'm feeding this the, the test set as opposed to the, the training de, uh, training data set because uh, again, I think that's that's more appropriate, uh, particularly for uh, the evaluating the model in terms of performance. Um, and then another thing we're doing is we're back transforming our model uh, calculations because because the the default output for our model is going to be on the, the the log scale, and we're using a log ten scale and and so there's just a couple extra pieces in, the, in in these explainer functions saying hey you know our true values we really should be taking the you know 10 to the power of the the logged value and then for our predictions again we're going to take take 10 to the to the to the log prediction to to get things on the um the raw scale that we're truly interested in any questions or comments there Okay, hearing none, we're gonna move on here. Um, this is just a, a quick overview of um, how these models performed. Again, this is gonna be slightly different than what the text would, would show, but um, what I'm seeing is that the, the deep version of the gradient boosted machine is superior across the four uh, metrics that we're looking at here. Um, so R squared, root mean squared error, um, of course, mean squared error and root mean squared error are tightly related. So you would expect those to be identical and R squared a lot of times would, would follow with root mean squared error. Um, but, but we see even for uh, median absolute deviation, the, the deep GBM uh, performs the best here. Uh, surprisingly, uh, random forest did not perform all that well. Um, in, in relation to some of these other models, you know, because we're getting a 92% R squared on the on the test set for the the deep GBM, only about 80, 81% for random forest, and our OLS model, that RM model, actually got about 85. So um, something I, I wouldn't have necessarily expected a priori, but that's what we're seeing here. Um, next, we, we look at a chart of. Uh, the absolute value of residuals. We've seen this graph in prior weeks. Um, so this gives you an idea of the spread of the residuals. The one on the top is the GBM, the, the deep GBM. And you can see that the overall range uh, of residuals is, is smaller than basically every other model out there, which is highly desirable, right? You wanna have kind of low spread. Um, and then not only does it have lower um, variation or spread overall, um, just on average, we, we seem to be getting a, a better residual as well. So those uh, red dots, I believe are, uh, actually, it, those might be the, the average values or the median values. I, I know the, um, the line in the middle is the, the median. And so the, the red dots are probably an average. Uh, I'd have to, again, double check. It's been a few weeks since we went over this, this chart, but um, the good news is so far it's looking like this deep GBM model is is the go-to because um, it because it appears to be uh, the more we look at it the the the, the better it, it appears uh, in comparison to the other three models. Okay, um, here we're moving on to um, predicted uh, against um, actual um, values, um, and so this gives you a sense of the the bias in our models. And what we're finding is that these models tend to overstate player value for those um, lower value players. It tends to underestimate the values for the uh, expensive players. 
Um, and this is pretty much common in, in many you know, machine learning models. You, you find some, um, some sort of tendencies like this where, where you know, the extremes are the most difficult to predict. Um, what's cool about this is the, the GBM deep model on the top left is uh, much tighter. You know, in a perfect world, we'd, we'd see um, the curve kind of fitting on the, the, the AB line that, you know, with intercept zero slope one, but it's pretty close um, compared to these other models. And you can see that the, the OLS model doesn't do a bad job either in terms of bias overall, but, but the GBM, the deep GBM is uh, really tight. Okay, and then uh, these next few lines of code are really just showing you how to how to do these for an individual model, how, how to do the model performance metrics. Um, you know, it's 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 a simple one-liner um, for the the deep GBM here to get all four of those measures, which is great. So you, you don't have to do much work. And uh, here we're just showing you an example again for the the deep GBM model of how you create the. Uh, actual versus expected, or sorry, predicted versus actual values from our model. So, you know, this is kind of redundant with what we showed up up on top here, but this is just for um, one particular model. Okay, and this is um, me getting on my um, soapbox a bit. I, I alluded to this earlier. This isn't part of the EMA book, but I, I would just caution folks that, you know, when you're dealing with few target variables, yes, you, you might want to explore taking a transformation of that variable um, and then back transforming it. But um, you may also want to just try fitting your model on the raw scale uh, before you um, do a transformation. Um, you know, it is possible that you actually get a better fit, even though you're seeing a, a skewed skewed variable. So, so keep that in mind. It, it should not be a universal rule that you need to do something like a log transform just because you have a right skewed target variable. Um, I, I will say, um, you know, a lot of these models here are tree-based, like the random forest and the GBMs. And, um, you know, my understanding is that in general, if you have predictors that are right skewed, it really doesn't make much sense um, to do, you know, like log transformations, you know, the log transformation is a monotonic transformation. It preserves the ordering, uh, you know, from the, from the raw scale. And, um, you know, I, I think, you know, in general, the, the, the models are still going to find, you know, good cuts in the data to, to, to bisect the tree. Um, of course, they're going to be at different values on a log scale, but at the end of the day, you know, performance tends to be comparable. So, so really we're just talking about the, the target variable of whether or not you should should log it or take out some other transformation. But but log, of course, is probably the most common one out there. Um, one thing you may or may not realize is if you take the log and then apply the inverse to that, you do result um, in, in, a, in a, a biased result overall. Um, and you can do some research on this. Uh, I, I put in a bunch of... <laughs> helpful links here, just discussion about doing these, these transformations and then back transforming it. And so, you know, for a lot of folks, depending on what you're doing, you may want an unbiased uh, result overall. And, and again, the procedure we talked about does bias things a little bit uh, where, where your, your overall result will be most likely understate um, the true values, you know, um, in aggregate. So, uh, one particular transformation that folks use, they, they've used it in the insurance space, you know, which is where I have domain expertise. It's called the Dwan's transformation. So basically it's, you know, you, you back transform, you, you fit the data using on a log transform target, you apply the inverse of your transformation. So a lot of times, you know, I use like natural log. So I'd apply, you know, the, you know, E to, e to the, the, the predicted value. And, uh, and then what the Dewan transformation will will do is it will multiply by uh, a constant, right? That's that's um, on top of what you've already um, predicted with with the inverse operation. And the idea with that transformation is that in aggregate you end up with um, an unbiased result overall. So um, I haven't 
you know, posted this to the, the, the GitHub repo for our book yet, but I, I, you know, I will do so soon. So if you wanna look at this, uh, it, it might be interesting to you, it might not be. Um, just for fun, I calculated these smearing adjustments for the four models, right? Um, and I'm not gonna get into the technical details of, of how the Dewan transformation works, just that, again, it's, it's just a constant multiplicative factor that you'd apply to all of your predictions after doing that inverse transformation. You can see they're not huge for most of these. Um, it, you know, For the OLS, you basically um, increase all of your predictions by 3.2%. Uh, random forest, it's much smaller. It's about a percent. It's about 2% for the um, deep GBM. We saw earlier that we're overstating for the um, you know cheaper players and we're understating for the expensive players. So this would get you a little closer on those expensive players, but it would exacerbate the issue um, for, for those um, cheaper players out there. Um, so you may or may not want to do this depending on your, your needs. If, if having an unbiased result overall is, is really important to you, I'd urge you to, to maybe look into some sort of smearing adjustment. Um, but at the end of the day, if you only care about, you know, like root mean squared error, which would include both bias and variance, uh, and variance, right, in that number, um, this may or may not improve this, the situation for you. Um, and, and just as a final kind of aside here, I, I looked at model fits um, using just, just the raw scale, so, so not taking the log transform, but fitting all these models then doing what the book suggested, which is, is doing that log transform and, and just taking the inverse. And then thirdly, uh, you know, modeling on the, on the log scale, taking the inverse, and then applying the smearing adjustment that I detail above. And uh, what I noticed was that the random forest model actually performed much better on the raw scale. Uh, so I got, instead of getting, you know, a, uh, you know, an 80, 81% R squared, I get 85% on the, on the raw scale. Um, I noticed for the most part that this mirroring adjustment did not improve things like root mean squared error or R squared uh, compared to, to how the, the, the textbook does it. Although for the deep GBM, I'm actually getting a, a slightly lower median absolute deviation if I apply this mirroring adjustment. Um, Hopefully I didn't lose the audience here. I, I'm not sure if anyone on the call is kind of familiar with kind of the bias that's introduced with, with log transforms and, and how to get rid of it. But again, this is just something I, I deal with since, since I um, am working in a heavily skewed space <laughs> when it comes to like insurance costs, right? So this is something that we do uh, to, um, you know, de-bias um, our results if, if we kind of start with a log trans transformation. Does this, does this make sense? Uh, Aaron, just one comment. Uh, it's interesting that you mentioned that the random forest with the without this information or with this information had a different result. Okay, yep. in fact, you know, uh, it didn't improve with the log transform as opposed to using the the the, the raw data. And mm -hmm. usually, that's very interesting because uh, you know, in the th in theory, those three base uh, algorithms usually they don't need they don't need the the transformation of the yep. of 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 not not only the dependent but any any predictor, you know that they work fine without any uh, any transformation. But it's interesting that there's a there's a difference. <laughs> yeah, and, and again, I I I was with you, and I I was expecting to see almost the same result, right. whether I'd log or or wouldn't log, um, mm. you know, but it turns out that. You know, you might want to explore both options if you're if you're dealing with mm -hmm. skewed data, and right. and again, you can look at a smearing adjustment too if if you're if you're worried about bias, but um, but but yeah, um, very interesting stuff. And um, if, if you guys are dealing with skewed data, you might might encounter this stuff long term. I guess I'll I'll just reiterate the point that it is not a universal rule that you have to log transform a target uh, variable that is skewed. It's it, it it might produce a superior result, but that is not guaranteed.
Um, and then one final thing is this is just based on one test set. I, I'd probably want a more robust look at this using cross-validation um, if this were a real life um, analysis. But um, given the limited time, uh, I just kind of had one, one test. Also on the same line, apart from you know using cross-validation, I've been uh, experimenting also with different uh, random seeds also. Mm -hmm. Okay, yep. sometimes the random seeds, you know, they get they get also a weird results depending on we see that you are using. So sometimes not not only the cross validation but also changing that random seed at least, uh, you know, maybe, you know, if you had a computing power, maybe a hundred, a hundred times, uh, you know, to get a more realistic picture. And that's something that I'm I'm I'm, I'm encountering more often. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So I mean, it's possible yeah. that that I you know experience yeah. a lucky lucky ba bounce with with one of these. Exactly. exactly. Not only so, with so. with not not only with the split of the training and test set, but then you know like random forest is 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 random, right? And so right, right. You could get a lucky bounce there too, where things look better or worse. Um, exactly. It's, so it's sometimes I say, hey, you know, that the random forest really you know performed really well, but then I change the random seed to any number, and then you know things don't look that so pretty. Okay, so uh, you know, ju just to keep that in mind, that the random seed, you know, you should also uh, take 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 a note on that. <laughs> yep, agreed. Okay, uh, so now we're we're moving into kind of the, the core model explanation uh, stuff that I think we were all interested in when we initially uh, signed up for this this book club. And first one we, we look at is is a uh, permutation based feature importance. And, um, you know, it's been <laughs> quite a while since we looked at this one, so I don't remember all of the specifics here other than I believe it involves random, uh, per, uh, randomly perturbing um, the, the values uh, that you're getting for certain values and, and seeing how, uh, you know, root mean squared error in this case changes, um, you know, how much it, it, like your model performance deteriorates just, just by having random values for your um, variable of interest as opposed to using what you actually saw. And so, you know, where you see a huge model hit um, would be a sign that, hey, this is an important variable. And so, um, you know, the, you can see on the, the X axis here, it, it, what we're looking at is root mean square loss after, um, you know, perturbing these, these variables. Um, and uh, and we're comparing all four models here, so you can see overall, like the um, RM model, which is the OLS, is is having some 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 pretty high uh, root mean squared errors, um, and so it shouldn't be surprising that the GBM is getting the lowest root mean squared errors overall. Um, but I do see, you know, some consistency, which is reassure, reassuring across some of these uh, tree models anyway. Where you have movement reaction seems to be is rising to the top as the most important variable. Age is important. It 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 seems to be um, really important for the OLS model, um, but it's it also you know the second most important variable uh, for for these tree based models as well. And you know I, I didn't do a, a, a huge deep dive on these, but again there is at least some consistency, uh, broad consistency. Uh, for, for top variables overall. So that that that's a good reassuring sign. Um, you know, that, that different models are suggesting the same variables are, are kind of rising to the top. Um, then we head on to uh, partial dependence profiles, um, looking at those four key features that we talked about before. Um, and, and this is just showing, you know, in aggregate how, how the model sees. Uh, the relationship um, between our target uh, variable, which again is player value, uh, uh, against um, these individual features. And this is kind of an alternative view of what we did earlier, where we did this data exploration, right? That these bivariate plots of looking at value against um, feature va uh, variables. What's what's great about the PDPs is um, you know, the idea is you're kind of factoring out the influence of other variables that might be confounding the result. Um, so you, you're not guaranteed that you're getting kind of a pure signal if you're just kind of in those early 
um, data exploration phases, right? You're doing a bivariate plot. Here, um, you, you know, hypothetically, you are kind of factoring out the influence of other, other variables. Um, with that being said, we are still seeing kind of similar results to our data exploration where, you know, you, you are seeing a drop off in, in player value with age. Um, here, I, I think the steep drop off is maybe a little bit later than what we saw just from that initial data exploration, but still like mid thirties, you're starting to see a, a pretty hefty, hefty dr uh, drop off um, according to, um, according to most of these, these models here. Um, and then similarly, these other skill variables, you know, it looks flat until you reach a certain threshold and then you start seeing like kind of a linear trend. Um, so, so that's kind of consistent with what we saw before as well. Um, just a couple other things to point out, you know, the random forest seems to be a bit of an outlier, um, in, in the relationship here, it's either on the top or the bottom in a lot of cases. And, and I see the same for the OLS model that, which is the orange line. Um, whereas the, the deep GBM, which is our high performing, performing model seems to be somewhere in the middle, uh, compared to the other models. So to so just kind of an, an FYI, it, it, it's less extreme. Um, compared to, to some of the other models. And um, I'm not going to focus too much on, on, on this, but this is just kind of the code you would run if you want to produce the permutation feature importance. It's, it's really just two lines of code and uh, not much more complex here for doing a partial dependence profile either. And, and so here I'm just producing the, the, the plots relevant to the deep GBM. Okay, um, and then you know finally, the the book runs through a, a few examples for for some players in soccer. I I I don't play soccer myself. I don't watch soccer, um, so um, and I think I misspelled this guy's name, <laughs> Lewandowski. Uh, I think I had an extra K here, but um, I'm I'm assuming he's a a fairly popular player, and. Um, you know, so so we can look at we can dive into the individual player attributes for for this this um, this player, and uh, you know we can look at a breakdown plot, which which kind of shows you how the model got to um, the projected value for for this player, and um, there is one one thing we learned is that for a breakdown plot, the ordering of the variables is really important. And so um, there is kind of a default approach that uh, the Daleks package uses to uh, assign kind of variable importance uh, with each of these variables. I'm not going to dig into those, dig into that, you know, the, the, the why or the how so much, but we, we know that the ordering is important. So an alternative uh, approach to basically doing the same thing um, it, it, uh, understanding how important variables are and, and kind of, you know, how um, certain features impact the, the prediction at Shapley values. Um, and the Shapley values are less sensitive to ordering just by the way this this technique works. And um, I think our top variables are still the same movement reactions, at least for Lewandowski is, is you know, the most important here. I think we're, we're seeing the same thing with the Shapley values. Second most important here is ball control. Ball control is number three for the breakdown plot. And then attack finishing, I think, kind of switches places with the, the breakdown plot where it's number three according to the, sh the Shapley value and it's number two um, for, uh, for the breakdown plot. Again, you know, if you're really trying to dig in, you probably want to identify the differences and try to understand what, why they are different across these different different methodologies. Uh, then we have CP Pro uh, for these four uh, variables that we've been kind of looking at these these key feature variables, and this is similar to a partial dependence plot, but it's specific to uh, the observation of interest in this case, it's, it's Lewandowski and um, the the little balls, the, the dark circles really reflect, you know, um, the, the the feature value for for this particular player. 
But this, this allows you to do a what if analysis to say like, well, if, if this player had all of the attributes held constant, except for, for instance, age, like if Lewandowski were, um, you know, 27, as opposed to early thirties, uh, he would be worth more money according to the model. So that, that's just an interesting, what if kind of analysis you can do here. And uh, again, you know, the, Lewandowski appears to be a really highly skilled, uh, player. Um, if he were less skilled, you can kind of run these what ifs about how much he, he or she should be worth. Well, I guess it's a he in this case. Um, what else do we have? Local fidelity plots. Uh, we looked at this uh, a few weeks ago, and this is basically looking at uh, nearest neighbors to Lewandowski. And so I think by default, we're looking at the 30 nearest neighbors and and then the the residuals, um, and the residuals are on the x-axis here. And then comparing that against the full population, and so you know this is just saying, well, the, is our model treating a Lewandowski-like player differently than kind of the you know the population as a whole? And what we're seeing here. Um, is that the nearest neighbors in, in the purple or blue here, uh, there's more extreme values for the residual, uh, both negative residuals over here on the left and then uh, more positive values on the right. So I'd say overall, it's kind of right skewed, um, meaning that I would say, you know, on average, our model is actually understating those Lewandowski-like players. Right, because the, these residuals here are positive, so meaning that our model underpredicted the actual. And you can see across the total population, you don't really see much bias overall. You know, you see some some residuals below zero, some above zero, um, but we get more extreme type values, particularly heavy residuals uh, for the Lewandowski type type players. Um, and, oh, and then. Uh, you get this uh, Kolmogorov Smirnov test as well, um, with a null hypothesis that says, like, hey, you know, the, the Lewandowski distribution. It, it, we're assuming that the null hypothesis would be the same as the rest of the population. Um, we have a really low p-value here, um, which would would suggest that we can reject the null hypothesis that those distributions uh, are the same, and and just. You know the this that that jives with our eyeball test here, because um, the distributions uh, do look look different. Um, and then we have the the local stability plot. Um, you do this for specific um, specific uh, features. So this is like a a CP profile um, for the the dark line would be for Robert Lewandowski, and then the other lines would reflect CP profiles for um, nearest neighbors. So it's so the players that kind of look like Robert Lewandowski. And what you're looking for here is consistency in the shape, not necessarily that you know the, the CP profiles would, would be identical, but the shape would be similar. And we are uh, fortunately seeing uh, a similar shape across age, right? Uh, across these different age bands. Um, so that gives us some evidence that our, our, our model is, you know, treating these players consistently. Um, as an exercise, uh, you know, the, 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 the book actually asked, say, hey, we should probably do the, a similar set of um, instance level exploration for Lionel Messi. Even, even I, who, you know, have very limited knowledge about uh, soccer, <laughs> familiar with Lionel Messi, um, I don't think it's really worth our while to to go through all of the ins and outs here um, specific for this this player since it's kind of re, um, it's redundant with what we just went over. So um, that's uh, that's all I have. Uh, and that was a lot of material for this chapter. Again, it was just kind of a rehash of what we learned into a single case study. Um, took quite a bit of time to 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 produce the, uh, the slides here since there was just so much, but, um, yeah, it was, a uh, it was a fun exercise. Um, any, any questions or comments before maybe we'll hand it over to Ricardo, um, to, to just show us, um, some examples in, in model studio.
any any other closing closing comments or questions here? No, I just want to thank you. Great presentation. Thank you, Angel. Yeah, that 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 that, that was a good, you know, a, a good analysis, and also you know, bringing out for the no transform, you know, uh, 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 rationale that are <laughs> out there that you should be you should be aware. Uh, let me, you know, uh, just add, you know, to what Aaron, you know, was uh, was doing in terms of. Let me see if I can share my screen somewhere here. Okay. Okay. Here we go. Okay, you can see my screen. Yeah. Yep. Okay, so I already, you know, uh, run the the model studio. Okay, you know, it takes takes a while. Uh, uh, to run, you know, depending on the uh, on the on the data set dimensions, etc. But uh, one of the things that I did was uh, use the 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 FIFA that the authors are using the textbook. You know, not the one that is uh, uh, it comes with the with the dialects dialects data set is different. And then I use uh, I feed it the uh, XGBoost. Uh, I didn't do the the splitting, just the you know the the whole data set because I just want to get a, a feeling of the lay of the land of what you know this uh, the the model is is treating each of these uh, variables and I did all of it okay so uh, you fit the model right you uh, create this explainer uh, you select some rows I select uh, Messi uh, Ronaldo uh, Neymar from Brazil and the Gea the Gea is a goalkeeper. Okay, so that's going to be interesting because in the express rated analysis, I don't know if you uh, visualize that there's kind of a bimodal uh, distribution in some of these, uh, you know, uh, uh, predictors. And mm -hmm. uh, the reason is that, you know, one corresponds to the goalkeepers, which are the ones in soccer is one of the ones that can use the, the, their hands. You know, is the, is the, is the post, you know, is, is the goal post, you know, keeper. Those are the ones that only can use their hands, the only players that you can have. The other ones can use, they can use, you know, every part of the body except the hands. So, you know, I just wanted to, you know, make sure that I had that in the mix. And then run the model studio, which is here, uh, this window, okay, which give us, you know, uh, you know, it, it divides the, you know, the, the screen in four, you know, different windows. And the first one that is going to give us by default is the feature importance. So as you can see, as in the GB, GB model, the deep GB model and other models, uh, some of the feature importance are reactions, ball control, age, finishing, and so forth. So they are, you know, kind of in that, you know, uh, high, uh, high level uh, that corresponds to the other models that Aaron was uh was saying and, and just so, to be clear this is this is the, um, the data set hmm. level feature importance right this is not instance right. level right C uh, correct yeah this this is the the the, the whole the 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 whole uh, data set yep. uh, global okay. global mm -hmm. so now uh because we uh, uh incorporated in the model to incorporate a se selected observations and you remember that we have Messi we have Ronaldo etc so now we can study, for example, for Messi and selecting the age uh, predictor, okay? Uh, we can you know, do our breakdown, for example. We can do our CP profile for the age. As you can see, is very, very flat, right? You know, for that, that particular uh, 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 player. And also the residual versus feature, which also confirms our analysis that depending on the age, there will be an increasing in the value of the of the player. There's going to be a peak, and then there's going to be a, a, a decrease. Okay, but if we compare this, for example, to Ronaldo, for example, okay, uh, Ronaldo has a, a, a lower value than Messi, and one of the reasons is because of their age. There's a difference of age between Messi and Ronaldo that is the key. Uh, you know, the key component. And you can see it in that CP Paribus where Messi was in the high, you know, in, in the, the 100, 100, 110 million euros, you know, a line. And here, 
for Ronaldo, right, is a little bit lower. And one of the reasons is because of this a particular parameter, the age. Okay, you can see it really, uh, uh, you know, uh, it, it, it strikes you, it strikes you better. And the other one is uh, the goalkeeper. The goalkeeper is in the, you know, in, in another, in, in, let's say in, in, in another uh, group, right? You know, you should be comparing goalkeepers with the rest of the players because that would be kind of unfair. Uh, usually they have a very particular position in the game that some of the characteristics of their, you know, of, of their performance are different than the other players. For example, you know, how, how, uh, how efficient is, you know, the goalkeeper in not, not, you know, permitting the, the other team getting the goals, you know, from the goalpost. So one of the things that I notice here is that, for example, a reaction is still there, but for example, GK handling, which corresponds to the goalkeeper is high, which is not such something that you don't see in the in the other place because that's not you know their position. Then reputation again the JK the JK uh, predictors etc. So you're going to see a different kind of set. So one of the uh, possibilities I would you know uh, try to you know if if I, if I wanted to get the most of this uh, data set with the machine learning models is that I would try to divide those goalkeepers and studying them separately from the rest of the data set, okay? To try to not, you know, confuse the model with those goalkeepers that have a different profile than the rest of the players, okay? And that's something that you can, you know, easily, uh, uh, you know, visualize in this kind of, uh, in, you know, in, in this, with this kind of tool, okay? So nice. that's basically it. Okay, yeah, Ricardo, I'm, I'm assuming you. I'm assuming yeah. you can uh, customize those dashboards yeah. to include a variety of additional uh, charts, right? That that we've we've looked at there, and it's that's yeah, just a small sample. Let, let me go. Let me go back to the model, okay? And yeah, for example, you can uh, choose from this ones, okay? You can shoot the Shapley values. Ah. You can use the accumulate dependence, yeah. okay? Accumulate dependence. Uh, you can choose uh, here, let me see again. You can choose average target, uh, accumulate dependence also, which is a global, right? Um, yeah, uh, at least, you know, from this choice, you know, you can do all, all this. All right. That's pretty slick, I like that. Oh yeah. And and it's a, it's a, it's a quick, you know, it's a, it's a quick method, you know, to try to get all, you know, kind of the lay of the land, you know, in terms of yeah. how the model is, you know, uh, uh, computing, you know, with this predictor computing uh, the result and how to understand the interactions of those predictors mm -hmm. with the result that we're getting. Excellent. Yeah, thanks for yeah. sharing that. That's that's uh, pretty helpful. Oh, yeah, it, it is, it is. <laughs> okay, so Angel. I think, you know, we can wrap it up, right? Yeah, it was a great experience, really. Thanks for enjoying this this group. I hope you learn as as I did. So oh, yeah. see you later. And let's keep in contact by Slack. And yeah, that's the end. We yeah. almost am really uh, close to the goal. So it was a really successful uh, book club, in my, my opinion. So thanks, guys, for coming. Yes, and thank you for uh, facilitating.